Welcome to the Breakpoint Podcast and our Q&A segment, Ask the Colson Center. I'm Shane Morris, host of the Upstream Podcast and one of the writers for Breakpoint. And I'm joined by John Stone Street, president of the Colson Center and the host of Breakpoint. And today we're answering your questions about church services in the metaverse, divorce and protecting women from abuse, the spiritual significance of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, and much more. All of these questions were sparked by Breakpoint Commentaries, Short Courses, and the Colson Fellows Program. If you've got a question you'd like to send us, all you've got to do is email us at askthecolsoncenter at colsoncenter.org. John, let's dive into the first question today, which is about the fundamental problem with virtual church, which is kind of this thing that has become conceivable due to the advent of various virtual reality technologies and the uh, the striving of various social media companies toward this thing we're calling the metaverse, the idea that we can create digital spaces to get together in a simulated fashion as an alternative in many ways to getting together in uh, real life space. And of course, we've done we've done this a little bit with things like Zoom. We're doing this right now uh, between Florida and Colorado in a sense, but this takes things to the next level. And this listener has a good question uh, about how far we can take that and whether the sort of uh, the initial gut reaction, the sort of gag reflex we have against the idea of a bunch of people with, you know, goggles on sitting around doing church is really justifiable, or if it's just kind of a, an emotional reflex. This person asks, I have a question after reading your commentary on the church and the metaverse. What makes this medium more damaging or different than any online television radio or mail ministry with virtual reality. A person is actually talking one-on-one and people can hold Bible studies together in a virtual space, which feels and looks like they're together. It's true. We're not in the same room, but then again, how are any of the other ministries I listed actually engaging with people they're ministering to? I think none of them even know their name, prayed with them or what they even sound like. I've been in Bible studies with a 90-year-old woman, and I'm friends with an 80-year-old man in VR. I've personally talked with people who are Christians living in China and have been in Bible studies virtually where non-believers just show up and listen. Like any new piece of technology, I understand people are going to push back. In the past, by the time the church embraces such technologies, they're behind the times and have lost the use of the new medium to its full potential. The pioneers are seen as crazy, but in the end, they're praised for their innovation. Is part of the problem the use of the word church? I wonder if there would be less fuss if words like outreach or missions were used then people would be less likely to be upset. In truth, all ministries are part of the body of Christ, the church. I don't think there's a VR church that says a believer is to live out their faith only online. That would be silly and unbiblical. What's the fundamental problem with the virtual church? I think I agree with almost everything that is written here. And I think almost everything that's written here was part of our commentary on this, uh, which is First of all, there is uh, a whole long history of uh, Christians, especially evangelicals, not so much outside of evangelicalism, but definitely evangelicals using um, new technologies in evangelistic ways. Um, That is uh, uh, part of the history, and and part of the challenge has been that truth from Marshall McLuhan that the medium is the message. And so each and every one of these came with their, that, that's listed online, television, radio, mail, all came with various limitations and various challenges. Mail ministry came with a injustifies the means sort of thing. Uh, in other words, we know it's working if the money comes in. Radio uh, comes um, from being able to push one-way communication to people uh, across another part of the world or another part of the country, but also, in a sense, uh, can be disembodied. And uh, in fact, that's been the kind of the primary issue with technology, which is why I think there is a problem with calling it the church. But this demands that we start with this idea of what is the church, and, and, and church is redeemed believers, believers are redeemed humans, and humans aren't less than their bodies. It's just that simple. It doesn't mean that evangelism can't go out uh, through these various technological means. It doesn't mean that there's no communication that takes place in virtual reality or in a virtual reality room. There is. Uh, The problem is when uh, church is completely digitized, which is the examples in which we used. 
Yeah, the problem happens when, or, or problems happen when we jump ahead into new technology for a pragmatic reason, i.e. it works, without asking what is it and how is it changing how we define things. So uh, I don't think that there's any reason to say that there's no place for evangelism and virtual reality or outreach or even Bible studies. I do think we need to be really careful on what church is. And we are a culture that increasingly denigrates the body. Uh, We can look to moral challenges throughout history uh, for why that's a bad idea. We can look to community issues throughout history on why that's a bad idea. And we can also look, and this is really careful, not just the way it's been misused, but also what what Scripture clearly teaches about what it means to be human and, and, and how even Paul uses analogies of the physical body to describe what it means to be the church. The, the church has seen a anti-physicalist worldview in very, very various forms, the most prominent being Gnosticism, as being antithetical to to uh, the church being something that actually damages the church. At least three, I think, epistles in the New Testament were specifically written to deal with that heresy. And that heresy is specifically a way of either uh, subjugating the body or denying the goodness of the physical body or um, chalking the physical body up to evil altogether. And Paul in particular, but also John, sees this as as a real problem. So Something that immediately disembodies us is something that should come with red flags. Again, doesn't mean that it can't be used. I think we actually were pretty clear about that. The only thing I think that I would say, I don't know that I I agree with this, is I don't think there is a VR church that says a believer is to live out their faith only online. Maybe. uh, I'm I'm not sure. I'm not sure uh, that there aren't churches that don't talk about the church as if it's come here and see the cool stuff we're doing and never get to that point of what it means to live out your faith, you know, outside of that. Because a lot of these churches that have embraced this methodology have previously embraced a theology of the church in which the church becomes the center for outreach rather than the center for equipping catechism and preparing Christians to go out into the world. And that's a dramatic difference. I do think there is probably uh, churches that are virtual reality that are built on um, that are built on being only online, and that have embraced the doctrine of the church, which isn't outward focused or missional focused um, at all. And that creates two questions: Number one, is that really the church? Can you really have the church when you don't have real people? Uh, and real bodies, which are part of real people? And second, can you really equip Christians for the larger world uh, only online? So, I, you know, again, I think we had to go back to the theology of the church, what the church is, what the church is for. And, um, and, and, and I hope instead of, you know, somehow elevating this as more damaging or more dangerous, I'm not, you know, I, th- I think it probably has its unique challenges, and some of those are greater than times past. But I think at the very least, we should learn from our mistakes in adopting technologies without thinking through all the ramifications of those technologies to the best of our ability. When you use the phrase that Marshall McLuhan came up with, the medium is the message, that's become uh, illuminated in my thinking recently by just observing the way these technologies tend to uh, change not only the answers people give to questions, but the kinds of questions they ask. So. The, the question here is sort of, well, can't church make use of these virtual tools? And the answer is, of course, yes. The question we should be asking is, what is the church doing with these tools? Um, because, as you mentioned, embodiedness is an essential part of worship because it's an essential part of being human. Um, So the question we ask is not, can these technologies to any extent replace embodied worship? The question is, can they assist the church in various outreach functions? We have to then ask what this technology actually does. If it cannot replace embodied worship, then what is it doing? It's conveying information. There's an exchange of, uh, of information and ideas that takes place over uh, over some kind of virtual meetup. 
And we need to be careful that that doesn't change the way we think about the church itself, that it doesn't become the totality of what we believe the church actually does in exchange of information. And I think um, if we ask ourselves honestly, where a, a typical kind of low church evangelical mindset is when it comes to the purpose of going each week on Sunday, it's it skews in the direction of an exchange of information, right? You're there to sit and listen to uh, kind of a, a, a pious TED talk. And that's the, that's the real crass way of describing, but, but that's the mindset that I find myself slipping into at times. You know, I'm there to get some information and once the information is, is downloaded, then I can leave. Well, if that's the case, then why do I need to be there in the first place? Why can't I just download the information remotely? It changes the way you, the, when you begin to focus on that medium, it changes the way you think about the message itself. And it changes the questions you ask about that message and about that institution. I found this helpful. Uh, is to see you know the church as one sphere of Christ's sovereignty, one area in which he exercises authority over our lives. It's kind of the crown jewel, but there are other areas, other spheres. And do you think about the family, for instance? Can you imagine, John, uh, holding family life exclusively on a virtual reality uh, sort of platform? You can't do that. You can't imagine being a family exclusively over that for any extended period of time and not actually getting together and having a meal. And of course, this listener agrees that you couldn't do that exclusively. But what's the boundary? You know, what's what's the point at which you are emphasize you are relying too heavily on virtual reality in order to hold family life together? Is embodied presence with one another in the same place physically? part of family life, essentially? And the answer is yes. Well, family is one of the metaphors that the Bible uses to describe the church. And so we have to we ask ourselves, how much of the church's actual mission can be accomplished over this medium? I think the answer has to be that there are, there are core functions that simply cannot be accomplished over any long-term basis across that medium, right? You have to well, have embodied example. presence in order to, go ahead. Well, no, the example of the family is also a good one for um, why it's so important to go in uh, ahead of time thinking and asking questions about, okay, what's this thing about before I adopt this technology? Because how many families have just adopted tons and tons of technology and wake up three years later and realize that their pa their kids aren't looking them in the eye anymore? They're, they're not having family meals anymore, you know? And it's not intentional. It's not like everyone adopted the technology thinking, hey, let's divide our family, even though we're in the same physical structure. It just happens. Uh, and that's the point uh, that the lessons we should learn from history is that the church has adopted technology and woken up later on and realized that things have been changed about the message, about uh, the idea and concept of worship, about the success of the church in catechizing believers, uh, even theological shifts away from things that historic Christianity has always taught was really, really important, like the body. Yeah. This, this kind of medium is a metaphor. I, I forget what I, I read at one point, but it, it talked about, it was a lengthy essay about the mind and it was called, uh, your brain is not a computer. And I forget which publication it was in, but it was a really great explanation. It goes through historically um, how the brain was thought of in terms of whatever, it, through the metaphor of whatever current technology was used for communication or information processing, right? So people used to compare a brain to a uh, kind of printing press, and then they compared it to a clockwork watch. And then eventually we came to compare it to a computer. And it said that none of these things are precise analogs or even good metaphors for or analogies for what the brain is. I think there's something of the same effect happening when we talk about doing virtual church, the metaphor of virtual reality, and it is a metaphor. Um, in, in its most basic form, is changing subtly how we think about the reality itself. Just like the screens constantly present in the household change how you think about the household itself, change how you think about the family. We have to be careful that we don't let our metaphors, our, our digital metaphors, remodel how we view the reality. We have to get back in touch with what the reality itself is and then make those digital means our servants in that direction. I'm, I'm really sensitive to this question because it is, uh, it's, it's really uh, basically about 
the church's embrace of technology and whether we can, whether there's a middle ground between uncritically accepting everything and letting it change us, like we just described, or being Luddites, you know, just rejecting things and getting behind the times, like this listener says. And I, I, it sounds like you're saying it, and I believe as well, that there is a middle ground, that there is clearly a point where we can ask critical questions of these technologies um, that are rooted in what we're actually doing as a as a, an organism, as an institution, as the body of Christ. And those are the, I mean, those are the right questions. And I don't know that they produce hard and fast answers, but they certainly guide us in the right direction of critical thinking, as opposed to just, you know, accepting things as they come. Yeah. I'd, I'd probably only nuance that I hate the language of balance or middle ground. Cause I think that's almost always a way of compromising everything that really matters. I, I think what I, what I want to argue for is starting with definitional realities. Uh, defining the terms is the first step, not only in winning a debate, but in being able to figure out how we should live, particularly in that four-chapter story of reality, creation, fall, redemption, restoration. We look at something in a fallen context like technology and then say, well, where is it good and where it, it, we, we, we ask the line question, where can I draw the line where I get right up to the line or not too close to the line? And, you know, everything on that side of the line is good. And everything on that side of the line is bad without ever going back to that T.S. Eliot creational question. Hey, what's this thing for? And once I know that now I can say, oh, here's how the fall impacts this. So what's church for? Churches, you know, calling out an ecclesia of, uh, you know, redeemed humans who have bodies, you, you know, and so you start defining it that way. And then you say, oh, how is the fall impacting this? And now I can ask, okay, now I know what it means to be redeemed, renewed, restored, reconciled to these creational realities uh, under the authority of Christ. Now, all of a sudden, things have purpose and meaning and I, you know, I, I just, maybe I'm deluding myself by thinking I don't do third ways and balances. And what was the, what was the word uh, you used? The, the middle ground. Yeah. yeah, the middle yeah ground. I just, I, that, that language just makes me think everybody's compromising on all sides. I, I don't want to compromise with technology. I want to use technology for its God given purpose and not, and, and not get uh, self deluded just because it works. Maybe I'm just too platonic. I've let that golden mean thinking <laughs> sink yeah. into my uh, my psyche. And I think of virtue in the, in those terms, not running to either extreme. Right. Well, the, the next question is obviously the incredibly relevant, probably the most relevant, um, um, question that we've got this week in terms of the news, what's happening right now. And it's about the invasion of Ukraine by Russia. And it is a good question because when we see this, these sorts of news items, I think that those of us who are trained, and, and really believe that we ought to look at the world and all that happens in it through Christian eyes, right? To see these things in terms of eternity, not just time, then we should have a, a, a take. We should have something to say here about the spiritual side, not just the geopolitical side of what's happening. So this person asks, I've been conscious of the propaganda from the media lately, especially after the pandemic. I'm wondering if much of the world is falling prey to propaganda around Russia and Ukraine. Is there a side to this conflict that explains why Russia is doing what they're doing without demonizing them? Also, I don't understand how the Russian church and the Ukrainian church play into this. Is there a faith element to this conflict? Man, yeah, those are two big loaded questions. And neither one of us are, you know, the historical experts on this. We've been talking a lot about this on our editorial team with our um, resident um, um, uh, historian who, because of his big, long, you know, epic beard, looks like a Russian oligarch anyway. L let me just say this. One of the challenges that happens when wartime occurs is that you start using warlike language for everything. The other thing that happens is you divide the world into good guys and bad guys. There's, a, there's an interesting thing, story during the Second World War where Bonhoeffer, Dietrich Bonhoeffer and this resistance group trying to uh, overthrow Hitler from the inside of Germany reaches out to Britain and specifically gets to Winston, Winston Churchill. And as the story goes, Churchill says, nope, don't have time for it. And, and his, his, his reason was a strategic one. One, he didn't think it would work. And two, he needed to continue to paint Germans as the bad guys. And by Germans, all Germans. And the idea that there were some Germans doing the right thing 
uh, uh, in Germany would undermine the British war cause. Now, whether that was a good decision or a bad decision, my point is the tendency is, is to you know check the box of here are the good guys and here are the bad guys and to see everything through that lens, uh, particularly uh, at a time of war. This goes back again to Solzhenitsyn, who said, if only there were the bad guys that we could round up and get rid of, and it would fix the world. Now, because there's not, just because the line of good and evil runs right down the middle of the human heart, just because you see the fall on both sides of the Russian-Ukrainian war, does not mean that they're equal violators of peace, does not mean they're equal aggressors, does not mean that it's not Putin who has for a long, long time, made his intentions very clear of wanting to recapture at least the territory and the glory of the former, you know, Russian empire. And uh, this is how he thinks. And one of the reasons that it's difficult for us to think beyond this uh, is because we don't think in terms of these long histories. Uh, Certainly Islamic nations do, and certainly some of these nationalistic, you know, uh, commitments to the history of the nation. We don't even teach teach our own history, much less a revised version of our own history. Well, I guess we do teach a revised version of our own history, but it's but it's not like a pro-history. Uh, it's, a, it's a different mindset. So when this question asks, is there a side to this conflict that explains why Russia is doing what they're doing? There is a side to this conflict that explains why Russia is doing what they're doing right now, as opposed to three years ago or waiting three more years. But that would be to misunderstand what is ultimately motivating Putin's worldview uh, and his actions against Ukraine. The other thing is there propaganda from the media lately. Of course there is. You can just bank on that. The most blatant and egregious forms of propaganda, however, are Putin's run up to this conflict, to his invasion, saying that, uh, you know, Ukraine is not really a state uh, or not really an independent state or shouldn't be an independent state, uh, making up claims about uh, genocide in the Ukraine, calling uh, the country, um, cer- certain forces within the country, Nazi, even though the president is Jewish. I mean, this is observably absurd pretext for war that has even taken by surprise people who have been in strong diplomatic relations with him in the past, like Condoleezza Rice and others. I'm not so. so I understand kind of the, the temperature behind the, this is. A, a skepticism of media, which is healthy and and oftentimes necessary. Also, a a thought that 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 painting the entire one side is good and the entire other side is bad doesn't do justification to the human condition because it doesn't. At the same time, it doesn't mean that one is not more guilty of this particular conflict than another. And I think pretty clearly Putin's actions that are unjustifiable by any sort of framing of just war theory, not to mention just kind of, you know, modern life together. The Russian church and the Ukrainian church do play into this, but there's a long history and we're working on some commentaries to articulate some of these histories and we're just wanting to get everything right. The Russian and Ukrainian church split. And of course, this was part of the larger story of the Orthodox Church splitting off the the Roman Catholic Church, even you know centuries before. But understand, in uh, in Putin's Russia, the Russian Church is subject to the state, at least subject to the whims of uh, of the state. So there's a nationalism and a religious nationalism that Putin has been appealing to in his justification for the war. Uh, that I don't think is justified in any sort of theological context or even historical context. There also is a a sense in which, and, and this is the part we're working on, and I don't want to give too many details because I'm not. I just want to make sure all the details are right. But that Ukraine offers a, a level of religious freedom that the, that Russia does not. In other words, there is a sense of belonging. You're a Russian citizen, Russian nationalism, Russian orthodoxy. Ukraine has uh, higher levels of freedom of conscience. And of course, the Ukrainian ambassadors are painting this uh, completely as Russia is threatened by the freedom that Ukraine enjoys. Ukraine has been a successful nation state uh, outside of the Soviet Union, and that's something that is a grave threat to Russia. Uh, And I think there's a lot of truth to that. There's probably, there's certainly more to the equation than just the Ukrainian ambassadors are painting it, because again, it's wartime. They're painting the good guys versus the bad guys. That doesn't change the fact that they're the victims of this uh, aggression and that Putin is the perpetrator of the aggression. 
And the Russian people don't have a lot to say about it. The Russian churches do not have the influence over the Russian state. Uh, the Ukrainian churches enjoy some level of freedom. Uh, there's a sincerity of uh, faith uh, among many in the Ukraine that goes way back. So all of that is, uh, is kind of part of this story as well. I was going to ask you, John, if this is a fulfillment of some biblical prophecy, but we've got a question coming up that is literally about that. So we'll, we'll save it for after the break. We're going to take a quick break right now, folks. We'll be right back after this to answer more of your questions. Stay with us. Christians in America can't have a cultural impact without restoring the church through the recovery of the wisdom that we've lost. If we're to endure the crises of the 21st century with hope, the renewal of our minds and a fully formed Christian faith, well, they're not optional. They are the call of every serious believer who longs to seek first the kingdom of God. And the Colson Fellows is an on-ramp to doing this. The Colson Fellows are a diverse group. They're a courageous community of Christians. They're corporate CEOs and university professors. They're homeschool moms, teachers, pastors, ministry leaders. They're people that go to church. They're you and me. And they're all pursuing God's glory in every area of life. We're accepting applications for the new 2022-2023 Colson Fellows term. It's a 10-month deep dive into Christian worldview that's guided by peers and leaders to help you build a three-year ministry vision for your location to equip you to stand in this time and in this place with Christian conviction and Christian love. For more information on the Colson Fellows program, visit our website at colsonfellows.org. Again, that's colsonfellows.org. We're back on the Breakpoint podcast and our Q&A segment, Ask the Colson Center, answering more of your questions from a Christian worldview perspective. Third question is very simple, John, but it's one about definitions. And it's, uh, I think it's a helpful opportunity to talk about the ramifications of some of the, the euphemisms and the, the, the weasel words that we have been taught to use or, or being pushed into using for some of these crazy new sexual experiments that our culture uh, approves of. This person asks, is gender transition surgery a form of sterilization? Or is forcing the idea of transitioning a way of forcing sterilization? Not necessarily. I think the answer is not necessarily just because now we have headlines that talk about the first men having babies and men chest feeding and things like this. Again, they're made up categories of existence, but people who have at least transitioned in appearance and still have reproductive capacity. The primary part of this concern has to do with uh, adolescence who are forced into a transitioning process. Now, there's a number of steps to this process. There's the appearance step, there's the chemical step, and there's the physical step. And there's various degrees within each. So the, phys the, the physical one has to do with cosmetic things that don't change any sort of you know, physical capacity or abilities. The chemical one can do real damage, uh, particularly to young women. This is something that Abigail Sh uh, Shire has written about in Irreversible Damage. And she's not talking just about the irreversible psychological damage that can be done by pushing kids deeper and deeper into, into an idea about themselves that does not correspond with reality and would, in that sense, be um, kind of pushing them into a delusion, of not just about reality, but about themselves, their own bodies, a, a form of body hate. Uh, it's kind of the new one. The old, the old form of body hate in the 80s was putting pinups and airbrushed, you know, swimsuit models and making all junior high girls feel bad. And the new version is kind of this cool new way of abandoning uh, the female body altogether to, to look like young, you know, men. There's the cosmetic form of that, but the chemical form of that does real damage. There is a sterilization uh, aspect that can happen. And then, of course, if you go the next step of physical transition, then, you know, again, these are done in degrees. So any, anything, obviously, that is irreversible in terms of a surgical procedure then would be irreversible. It's a, it's, it's a, it's, it's a tragic thing. And of course, all of this is being done in the context of these new family structures, new understandings of a gender and identity, and then demanding procreative power on the, on the other side of it. So, you know, men becoming moms, women becoming dads, redefining gender redefines parentage, choosing a relationship that in and of itself is sterile, like a same-sex relationship, and then using 
laboratories in order to demand uh, children, uh, biological, quote unquote, children uh, through in vitro and other things. So that when you uncouple this inherent relationship between sex, marriage, and babies, uh, sex being male and f- not just being um, the, the sexual act, but sex being male and female from marriage and from procreation, uh, then it does have uh, a sort of sterilizing effect. Now, of course, we've had historical settings in which people have been forcibly sterilized out of eugenics co- concerns or eugenics strategies or something like that. In which certain, you know, the idea was to disallow certain uh, races or certain groups of people from reproducing. That was an intentional plan. Is this intentional? No, I don't think so. I mean, maybe some people harbor that same sort of eugenics fantasy. I think the deeper thing is, is we think that the ultimate good and highest good in life is being able to do whatever we want and be whoever we want and nature itself be damned uh, if it gets in my way. And if that's the approach that we think about, then we think about ourselves as being uh, not part of the created order, but over the created order, not in a stewarding way, but in a demanding, uh, oppressive sort of way. Uh, We think about the rules of reality, since, by the way, we've already changed the rules of morality, so now let's change the rules of reality to conform to what we want. Uh, These are the consequences of these sorts of actions. And will some folks be sterilized along the way? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's what happens, including uh, what we're, if Abigail Shire's right in her book, Irreversible Damage, as well as uh, Ryan Anderson and, and some of the others, uh, there's a, uh, an effect that is taking place to, on young kids. And the data we have says that the vast majority of them would grow out of this delusion or this dysphoria if given some time and, and, and given some space. But to do this sort of kind of irreversible damage, to use again the title of her book, uh, chemically and even physically, is uh, child abuse. So, um, yeah, I mean, yeah, obviously the question is, what do you mean by transition? What do you mean by sterilization? And but once you get to what each of those words means and implies, you know, there there is a uh, a correlative relationship, to say the least. I would even say. say this in more overt and uh, uh, and sort of forceful terms i've i've read two essays lengthy essays in the last few days one was one was by a young lady who was uh, giving an account and we sent this around the editorial team giving an account of her uh gender transition as a teenager and and young adult um to become or to look like a man. She never went through a sur- surgery, but she did a, a hormonal transition uh, in defiance of her parents. It kind of ruined that relationship for a time. And it was her account of how um, not only did this destroy her life, but she was railroaded into it. She was told that at every step that this was normal, natural, good for her, standard practice treatment, and that this would make her happy. And it was just this constant promise of a utopia once she became a boy, it would fix all of her psychological problems. And she hadn't, she didn't have to confront any of those problems because she was so consumed with this delusion that taking testosterone and changing her clothes and her pronouns would make her happy. Um, and of course it didn't. And she's now kind of an activist against the whole transgender thing. She has, she is one of those people we say should not exist, the detransitioners. And her story is, is heart wrenching, but it's well written and just worth the read. The other one was a, kind of a, a screed, but it was a very sophisticated screed by uh, Thomistic Aristotelian philosopher Ed Fazer. And he describes the transgender movement in, in the setting of larger cultural sickness, uh, where there is a, he, he paints ours as a civilization in moral and uh, categorical collapse. So we're losing it, uh, crucial categories of what it means to to be human and to be a community together, a society that uh, that's striving towards something and has an objective uh, picture of reality to guide us. And he he views the sterilizing aspect of all of this. Ed Fazer's point was that the sterilization uh, effect on individually and socially, the fact that these things lead to the to sex and gender expressions that are not fruitful in any way 
is characteristic of dying cultures. It's one of the symptoms of a uh, a civilization in decline, in sunset, that we are deconstructing reality itself in the name of our claimed freedoms. And so I think there is a there is a, a real component of intentional sterilization here, even if it's uh, kind of subconscious, even if it's on a social level and not an individual level, that we are embracing increasingly every form of sex and gender expression we can that it, other than the natural one, right? Other than the one that results in children. And he has this phrase where he says, we've, we have endorsed and celebrated the least fruitful kinds of sex. And the most, the, the rarest kind now is the one that actually results in children and family. That's the kind that's unfashionable. That's the kind that makes you square. And this other young lady in her essay um, said that the initial thing that pushed her into transgenderism, uh, this rapid onset gender dysphoria that she experienced was the fact that in her Tumblr community online, the, her cisgender white female status made her the bottom of the totem pole. It made her the least popular member, the one who was only supposed to apologize all the time for being who she was. And she realized she could get some of those targets off her back by identifying as some gender non-conforming person. And gradually that became her reality. So it's, there is a, a sort of you know, meta-narrative of sterilization culturally that is happening here that, that thinkers like you know, the, this philosopher I mentioned have noticed um, that, that answers this question, I think. I promised an answer to this last question, uh, which is also uh, prompted by the crisis in Ukraine, and I'd like to get to it. This person asks, in your commentary on Ukraine last week, you quoted Matthew 24. This one's a bit confusing to me. In Matthew 24, Jesus was telling his disciples about how to deal with the near-term judgment on the unbelieving Jews. We now know that was the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. It also ended the Old Testament sacrificial system. This is a hugely significant piece of Christ's advent, ascension, judgment moment in history, and it wasn't addressed as such in this podcast. I know there are other views of Matthew 24, but they have serious flaws. In reading through your commentary, I would interpret the Matthew 24 passage and the link to the Ukraine-Russia conflict as signs of the end of the world. Is that what you mean to do? Can you help explain the use of Matthew 24 as a guiding text in that commentary? No, we weren't actually using that in that sense at, at all. Matthew 24 talks about not the signs of the end times, uh, in my view, but uh, as it was specifically in response to questions about the destruction of the temple, uh, which obviously was a uh, seemed like the end of the world uh, to many in that context, but 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 wasn't. We use the, that, that passage more because what Jesus actually does, I think, is really put the destruction of Jerusalem and the onset of calamity and war with a really long tail into history. There will be wars and rumors of wars, uh, but the end's not yet. In other words, it ain't, you know, th these things aren't it. My, 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 uh, one of my friends, the late, uh, I would call him great, Michael Bauman from Hillsdale, you know, talks about this passage. and. Says, you know, can you imagine? You know, Jesus is going to give them this super inside knowledge about what the future is going to hold. You know, and they've been waiting for this, and he's like, "Okay, there's going to be wars," and they're like, "Oh, this is good. I'm going to write this down. Rumors of wars, famine." You know, the point, according to Dr. Bauman's uh, read on this, was that you know, the, the, what's really happening here is Jesus saying, "You know, look, this is life in a fallen world, um, and none of these things are." this secret sign of a particular view of the end times. So uh, I agree uh, that many views or many of the ways that Matthew 24 is read has serious flaws. I think all views that I've heard of Matthew 24 or the end times have plenty of socks hanging outside the theological suitcase. None of them wrap them up super neatly. Uh, and so the point of using this passage in this text was that this is exactly where Jesus talks about what it means to not be overcome by the chaos and the calamity of the moment. What does it look like for us to be able to endure to the end? Uh, what does it look like for us to uh, be able to continue to follow Christ at a time when it's very difficult to see what the future, at least the immediate future, holds? In particular, the part of this discourse that we quoted, 
talks about things that have been pretty common to the human condition. Wars, rumors of wars, uh, famines, uh, kingdom turned against kingdom, nation against nation, earthquakes, both acts of what's called moral evil, wars and attacks, and natural evil, uh, which really, in my mind, lends itself to say, you know, Jesus is talking about what it's going to look like uh, kind of in the days ahead. And, you know, with these kind of clues in there, the end is not yet. These are just the birth pains. Uh, you know, that, that language of birth pain is, I think, so instructive because, and by the way, that's in verse 8 of chapter 24, because, you know, it reflects this kind of long waiting and what it means to have both joy and calamity and pain, you know, in the same event. And that language is used of the kingdom um, in, in a couple of different places. So, yeah, there was no uh, pretext or subtext or any of this. Uh, I certainly have my views about the end times. I paid a seminary a lot of money to get them, so I'm going to keep them. But that was not being kind of read or smuggled in either by myself or Dr. Paget. And he did the, the lion's share of the work on, on this piece, and we went back and forth even on some of the language here on using Matthew 24 and where does it fit. There was nothing here uh, being smuggled in uh, other than this is uh, how Jesus tells us uh, to be faithful to the end. To be fair to you guys, the Olivet Discourse is literally one of the most fought over sections of the New Testament that I can think of. I I actually cannot think of another, unless, unless it's in Revelation somewhere, I cannot think of another section that's more sort of fought over in the context of modern eschatology. So... I mean, yeah, navigating that that reef of rocks was, you know, a task in itself. That's that's fairly impressive. And I guess I would I would just want to point out that it sounds like this reader would agree substantially with my own view, which is um, kind of in, in line with the Peter Lightheart, James Jordan, Alistair Roberts, more preteristic view of the passage that it, it is substantially about or primarily about what happened in seventy A.D. The, the end of that uh, era of redemptive history and the ushering at the judgment of Jerusalem and the ushering in of something new, because that was the question the disciples asked, right? It's about the temple. But I think that view is very much compatible with a sort of prophetic, to use the term that's often used in eschatology and an idealist reading. There's something there to be said for, okay, look, this was about immediate events, but there's also a timeless echo of it throughout history and truths here that we can apply to all of um, all of redemptive time. Maybe one way to put it is that, yes, the Ukraine-Russia conflict is a sign of the end of the world. So was the Revolutionary War. So was the invasions of Genghis Khan. In other words, wars and rumors of wars are signs of the end of the world. Jesus doesn't say which ones are. You know, it's this one because it, you know, uh, or it's that one. Jesus essentially says that uh, it's wars, it's earthquakes, it's famines. These are the birth pains, that's a language Paul then will use later, of a fallen world. Uh, and yet the end is not yet. So to say that there are signs of the end of the world doesn't mean that there are signs of the immediate end of the world. Doesn't mean that there are signs that are you know uniquely instructive as opposed to others. Uh, it's just that you know, sin is the end of the world. This is the language that the serpent uses. In the day you eat of it, you will surely die. And with that death comes a death to the created order, as we read about in Romans chapter 8. So in other words, the, the brokenness and fallenness of the world is its perpetual condition after the garden, but it's not the full end of the story. And that's creation, fall, redemption, restoration. We need not abandon that larger narrative that the Bible clearly tells of reality in order to get our details right of how exactly redemption and restoration, that chapter will transition you know, into the renewal of all things happens. Uh, I hold those views, but I hold them pretty loosely. Uh, you know, I, I think some views of end times are better than others, but you know, I, don't, uh, I don't telegraph it because I think at the best they're our, our, you know, as, as, as another theology prof put it, our best attempts to figure that stuff out is like our refrigerator art, you know, that we, we give and give back to God. And he puts it on his fridge and he likes the fact that we're thinking about it, but may not be accurate to scale and to reality. I, I think this stuff matters. I just want to say what the Bible says. And what the Bible says is that wars and rumors of wars are signs of the end of the world, not the immediate end of the world, but the, 
but the long uh, slouch outside of uh, Eden uh, towards brokenness and decay, which is part of a larger story that Christ is uh, writing and making all things new. So I'm happy to land the plane there. It's good stuff to talk about, John, especially um, in light of the way we watch the news cycle and it makes us super nervous. I I had a friend text me a couple of days ago, immediately after the, the invasion started, and he said, this whole thing has my heart beating constantly. It's like, I'm, I'm like on edge. And he's got a, he even mentioned that he has a son who's sort of coming up on draft age. And of course that's thinking eight or nine imaginary steps into the future, right? To World War III. And it's the kind of thing that anxiety does. It gets us thinking ahead more and more and more and more. We want answers. And in many ways, that seems to be the, the attitude of the disciples in that passage where they're asking, oh, tell us what's coming. You know, what are the, <laughs> what, what's gonna happen after this so we can ease our anxiety and, and Jesus gives them this famously enigmatic answer um, that in many ways echoes down through the ages and, and gives us that same assurance that the world is groaning. The world is in birth pangs, um, as even Paul picks up in, in Romans 8. The world is having these, these uh, birth pangs, these, child, uh, these, these pre-childbirth labor experiences, but something's coming. A new creation is, is on its way, and that's the, that's the sign that we have that something new is coming and that our hope can ultimately be founded outside of the conflicts of this age. Well, thanks so much for joining us today on the Breakpoint Podcast and our Q&A segment, Ask the Colson Center. If you've got a question you'd like us to answer here on the program, all you have to do is email us. The address is askthecolsoncenter at colsoncenter.org. For John Stone Street and the Colson Center, I'm Shane Morris, and we'll see you next week.